Parsons or Green Men, we're talking about you and me. We are strangers, pilgrims of this world. We talked a little bit about submission last week. We left off in 1 Peter chapter 2, talking about obeying our leaders, government, and the like. We also talked about the beginning of it. We talked about how we are living stones built upon the stone, which is Christ, that same stone that the Jewish leaders have rejected, have crucified, put to death, the one that God has made precious, a precious corner stone. And that precious cornerstone, which is Christ, to the Jews was a stone of stumbling because they were jealous of the Messiah because he had threatened everything that they stood for. He had threatened their, their power, their leadership, and even did not stop with Christ. They did so to his own followers, as we've noted in our Bible class this morning from Acts 5. We talked about how we are a chosen family, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, how we belong to God. God owns us. We do not own ourselves. And that God has called us out of that darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Not just light, it says marvelous light. We talked about how the Gentiles that were not once a people but now are the people of God. And of course we would be included in being part of that. It was back to that mystery Paul talked about in Ephesians, how God in one body placed both Jew and Gentile. We talked about how we are sojourners and exiles and how that applies to our being an alien to this world and to stain from lust that wage war, wage war against the soul and keeping our conduct well. We know it's better to, to suffer for, wrong, for good than it is wrong. And in other world that will slander us as evildoers. We shouldn't be ashamed because of that, but because of our good works, our light, our works that glorify God, Matthew 5, 16, as they observe them, they will glorify, that's what it does, it glorifies God. It will give God glory. The things we do for God should give Him the glory, never ourselves. That's right. And that's the difference between us and the world. The world glorifies themselves, the Christian glorifies God. And so that's who we are to re reflect. And it should come to no surprise when the world thinks of us as different because we're pointing to Christ and not things of this world. Amen. And of course we talked about being subject for authority, for kings, every king, even the one that does good or bad. We know that if that government decided to come against God's word, it says, as the apostles, we need to stand firm and say we must obey God rather than men. But whenever it's coming to things that are not uh, over, uh, overcoming the works of God or the things of God, we are to submit ourselves to that because that's how the apostles did and that's how Christ did. Yes, the apostles said we must obey God rather than men. There's also times where they respected the authority of the king, such as in the case of Paul when he would uh, address Festus and Agrippa and the kings, when he'd say, O king, O king, he would be respectful in his defense. And, and we were talking about how to act as free people. We know that we're, we're servants, we are willing slaves of Christ, and that we are not to use our freedom as a, as a covering for evil, but use it as slaves of God. And then we, pick, we left off with honor all people, love the brethren, fear God, and honor the king. In keeping with the same idea of, of submission, this, this title is from what we discussed in the Wednesday class session of Bible Camp was Alien Submission in Christ. Alien Submission in Christ. And we began in verse 18 by saying, uh, Peter says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are cro crooked. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God... A person bears up under sorrows when suffering unrighteously. Servants, slaves, they're not as what we would term today as slavery. 
We know that there were laws governing slaves in, in the old law, and they were not treated as harshly as, as, as those that have in our recent history have been. Slaves were given, uh, were treated well, were supposed to be treated well. Kind of like a hired hand if someone works for an employer boss relationship, an employee employer relationship. The employer was to treat the employee with kindness and, and things like that. And it says, subjects, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not, for the, not only for those that we like, those are our good and considerate, but also to those who are crooked. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? What if you had a boss that you couldn't stand? How are you to act to someone you cannot absolutely stand? Should we have the mindset of, oh, I'm going to get him back? No. I'm going to show him the love of Jesus. I am going to treat him like Jesus would. I am going to put the mind of Christ because I know that doing good and, and being considerate and being subject finds favor with God. Amen. Because it's more better to have favor with God than favor with men. Paul said, "If he were not a servant, if he were not a servant of God of, of Christ, if he were to please men, he would not be a servant of Christ." Paul did not seek to please men, but to please God. That's right. Paul was, it was faced everything in the book from from threatened be, from stoning to all the ways of martyrdom. Ran out of cities because he preached the truth. Put in jail. But he did not give up. He did not stop preaching the whole counsel of God as he told the elders of Ephesus. I have shown not to declare the whole counsel of God because it doesn't matter what the world says. It matters what God says. It's about what God wants. It's about His favor, not the favor of men. And our conduct can win over those that may be not good or considered at the time. We need to help, help to show ourselves like Christ. No matter how difficult that may be. You may be in a situation like that where I don't know how, what's going to happen next. But we do know that there's a God who's in control. Who helps His children. And notice this. It says, this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person, I love, I love how this says, what, what it says this, bears up under sorrows when suffering unrighteously. No one loves to suffer for doing good, do we? No one loves to suffer for standing up for what is right. We might find that strange. That how, is it, how is it that I'm doing good and yet the world treats me like trash? That doesn't make any sense. They should, they should be glorifying God. Look at the book of Acts. The, the signs, wonders, and miracles that the, the apostles did to, 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 to proclaim the glory of God, to show God, to, to confirm the message. Those Jewish leaders, instead of submitting to what God wants, even despite the fact that they couldn't, whenever Peter he, and, and, and John healed, healed that, that lame man in Acts chapter. Three, they said that the miracles be done in our midst, and we cannot deny it. But yet they would not submit themselves to the righteousness of Christ. They would not submit themselves to God. They continued in their jealousy and sought to stomp out the Christian way. Over and over. They did it with Jesus, and they're doing the same with the apostles. And don't be surprised when the world does it to us, because who are we to think if we're not to be treated the same way by the world? There's a reason why we're different. There's a reason why we're treated differently. Because we are. We are to be different. Holy and separate from the world, set apart to Christ. Because we don't belong to the world, we belong to God. We are God's possession. The world doesn't own us. God does. God does. Don't be surprised when the world treats us like, like dirt. Because they don't realize that what they're missing is the hope of Jesus Christ. They're too much infatuated with themselves and what they currently have. And the, the thing we have to convince people is 
that what God has is better than what they currently have. There are a lot of people in this world that have so much stuff that you've got to convince them that God is better than what they currently have. That's one of the reasons why in foreign countries, whenever in third world countries, when they don't have very much, it is easy to get by and study why. Because what you have in the gospel to them is far more worth than what they currently have. And in our nation today, we have so much uh, commodities, so much luxuries, that try to convince somebody that's, that's living in luxury that God is better. It would be a difficult task because they're, they have so much stuff that we're comfortable with. That doesn't mean it's impossible, by the way. That doesn't mean that we stop and say, well, it's too far. They're not going to accept it. They're, 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 we've got to be in luxury. It's just, let's not stop because the apostles did the apostles didn't stop preaching in the name. Jesus sent them to cause. The leader said, stop preaching in his name. They continued on. Because the mission of God is greater than the mission of man. Amen. They continued on. They continued. They, they endured that suffering just like you and I endure suffering. And notice verse 20. It said, notice, the, notice the difference. There's a difference between suffering for un, uh, suffering unrighteously for, think, for doing right and suffering because you did something unrighteous. Like a criminal. A criminal shouldn't expect, well, I committed this crime so I should get off with it. And so I'm suffering unjustly. No, he's suffering justly. But for the Christian, the one that's doing right, and he's put in prison or he's, or he's, he's treated differently, that's unjust suffering. There's a difference between suffering for doing good and doing evil. And so he says in verse 20, For what credit is there if when you sin and are hardly treated, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this finds favor with God. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good than it is to suffer as an evildoer. Because it matters of what God says about you and God's judgment than the judgment of man. Man's courts are not always perfect, are they? But God is a perfect judge who will always judge right, whom you cannot convince with evidence against. God has the evidence. God knows what happens. Man can get away with whatever he wants in this world a lot of times. But God never forgets. God knows. You can't run from God. As Johnny Cash said, you run on for a long time. Run on for a long time. The sooner or later, God will cut you down. And He will. Take that line one six and fall. He will take vengeance. God will, not man. God will take vengeance upon them and on God and obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the righteous judge, as the righteous vindicator. And that's a point also with this. We can endure for a little while because sooner or later, God will vindicate his children. You may not think that the evil boss or the evil or the, the, the not so considered boss or the not so considered person or the not so considered leader they're, they're, they're not being they're not being held accountable. What, what what's going on? God do something. Wait, he will. Every knee will bow before the King of Kings, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is. Lord, Bible says everyone will. Everyone will. Now the question is, will it be out of genuine love, out of obedience, or will it be confessing Jesus is Lord out of fear because I didn't do what was right when I needed to? There's going to come a day when, when Jesus comes back, and there's going to be a lot of people that's going to be looking up, and I'm not in awe of fear because it's too late. They're going to be doing right. And it's okay to suffer for doing right. Because eventually we'll have heaven. And that is so much more worth the punishment and pain. That's what Paul said in Romans 8. He said, don't even compare the sufferings of this world with, with heaven. That's right. it's, it's beyond comparison. There is nothing compared to heaven. It will be worth the trials of this life. And, and, and Peter brings out this example. Who's the example? Now Peter could have chosen, you know what? I'm going to talk about myself a little bit. No, that's not what he does. 
For to this you have been called. What's to this? A suffering. You are called to suffer for righteousness. You are called to do good. For, if you, for through this you have been called, since Christ also suffered for you. For you. I like what John Owen said. This is a powerful point. To suffer as a Christian is to suffer for Christ, for the name of Christ, for the truths of Christ, for the ways of Christ, and for the worship of Christ. We think about Christ. He is our example of suffering. Christ suffered for us. He did not suffer for Himself. He came with the purpose to die on the cross so that you and I might have the hope of eternal life. That, that was the only way that He could save man. Is that, is that by Him as God, the eternal Son, taking upon human flesh, taking upon that body so that He could die. He came to die so that He could redeem us. But He didn't say in the grave. Up from the grave He rose triumphant over death, the grave, right. Satan, in Christ, there is no condemnation. Romans 8 1. There is no condemnation because of that, what Christ has done. He suffered for us, leaving you, leaving us an example. You want to look at the pattern of suffering? Look at Christ. Don't look, and you, see the, you see Peter here not being selfish, he's being selfless. So he's saying, Look at me, look at Christ. Look, Peter is hiding behind the cross. Look at Christ on the cross. Look at Christ and His suffering. He's the pattern that you should follow in His steps. Who did no sin? None. Not one. Now fathom that. Because it's impossible for God to sin. But he was tested. Yet he did not sin. Did no sin. Now specifically, he did not revile back. He did no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Quoted from that great passage of Isaiah 53. That Lamb of God who was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He did no sin, no deceit in his mouth. He was truthful. He only spoke the truth. Who being reviled, oh, look at the leaders, what they did to him. Throughout his ministry, they, they tried to test him and trip him up and tried to accuse him of blasphemy and all sorts of things which he was not guilty. If there was anyone who had the right to stand up and to say whatever was on his mind, Christ Jesus would be one. He could have stood in the middle of that trial with mocking, saying, You're a blasphemy. He could have stood and said, No, I am not. And here's why. Let me show you this. But yet, he did not open his mouth. How many of us, if we were in a trial like that, facing death, would we keep our mouth shut? I don't think there would be a human being that would do that. Because that's a great temptation to do that. To say something. Say something back to try to defend ourselves. Christ. He did not open his mouth. That doesn't mean that he didn't say anything at all whenever he needed to. When Pilate asked him about his kingdom, he said, My kingdom is all over the world. He didn't revile in the same way they did. When they mocked, he didn't mock them. He answered righteously, and when he needed to keep his mouth shut, he kept his mouth shut. He did that for you and him to give us a pattern. Here's how you live. Here's how you suffer. Here's how you suffer for doing what's wrong. He is the example. He is he did no sin, no deceit. Being reviled was not reviling in return. While suffering, he was uttering no threats. Oh, if there, if there was any time he could threaten somebody, he could threaten them then. Do you, he could have opened his mouth right then and there and said, Do you not know that I can kill every single one of you in this room right now? I can call legions of angels to destroy this whole world and, and set me free. But he didn't. The song says he died alone for you and me. He went to the cross because he saw the greater purpose. 
He knew the greater purpose. He knew what the Father wanted. And He was faithful to the Father. If He had, if he had spoken up and He had stopped it right then and there, then man would not have a hope of salvation and Christ would cease to be God at that very moment. Because Christ, God, cannot lie. God cannot be unfaithful. The Son cannot be unfaithful to the Father. The Father gave Him a mission. And His mission was to, to come and die for us so that we could be saved. He was the Lamb that was slain. Before the foundation of the world, John pointed out John 1.29, He's the Lamb of God. Behold, look, right there. That's the Lamb of God. It takes away the sin of the world. That's the lamp. That's the example. That's the pattern. It's not me. It's Christ. He didn't utter any threats, but notice this. He kept entrusting Himself to who? To the Father who judges righteously. Oh, so great humility that, uh, that, that Christ, uh, Christ had. He was humble. You see that Christ throughout His whole ministry, even up to His death, where did He point to? I always do the same to please the Father. He points to the Father. That doesn't mean that Christ wasn't God. But it shows of His character of who He is pointing to the Father who was pleased. The, the, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, for it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. Why? Because in doing that, He's saving mankind. He had to die. Without his death, man would have no opportunity of salvation. None. Verse 24. Who himself, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Remember, Peter says, in him did no sin. He was not a sinner and he did not become a sinner on the cross, but he took hours away. He took our filthy rags away and gave, and, and, and gave us an opportunity of salvation. Who bore, who himself bore, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't get another lamb somewhere and, and sacrifice it. No, he was the lamb. Remember Abraham, remember Abraham in, in, in Genesis chapter 22? And he's taken up Isaac, his only son. And God said, Go on Mount Moriah, I want you to kill him. Sacrifice him. Remember what Isaac said as he got up on Mount Moriah? I see the wood and the things prepared, but where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? You know what Abraham fly? God will provide. And he, and he set him up on there to, to sacrifice him, and as he's going to slay, the angel says, Stop. Abraham proved that, proved his faith. Gave the evidence. That's how far Abraham was willing to go with trusting God. And so what did God do? God provided the lamb. And that's the bottom of the true lamb. The true lamb. You remember where Isaac said? Where's the lamb? John 1 man, the whole lamb. And God didn't stop the mess. It was accomplished. It drove right through his wrists. It drove through his, his feet. Not only that, he was scourged, beaten. Even that scourging he put him, couldn't put a man to death. Yet he, he, he wasn't dead yet. Can you imagine him being bloody and battered? And not only that, now he's got to be on the cross and his flesh is just torn. He's up on the cross, going up and down, and that word that wasn't that wasn't a soft chair. And it's taking all that punch and pain for you and me for our sins. He was our substitute. Mm -hmm. He died in my stead because of the sin of man, not his own. He died for you and me. He gave his life. For me, for you, even the very ones that crucified him. That's right. As he's on the cross, and he's, and he's the Lamb of God that's been slain, and as he's being slain, he says, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what to do." Now, who, now who in the right mind? Who, who, 
Who, which one of us, if we were on the cross like that, would say that about the prayer once to know on our feet to, to that, that would be a yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean that he universally just saved them without repentance and response. Because we know that in Acts 2, you, it is Jesus. You, you take him by all sins and crucify him. That's the name of God. I'm in the road. What can I do? Repent and baptize. There were some that were a part of that, that crucifying Jesus that obeyed the gospel that day. They were forgiven. Their sins were also forgiven. He died to save mankind. And yet those Jewish leaders and the ones that were put to death did not recognize, did not realize you're put to death your own king. You're putting to death the Son, capital S, of God. You're putting to death God in the flesh. Your very Messiah that you read about in the Torah and the law. You put him to death. And, and it seems as if every time I read the gospel story, the gospel accounts, and the account of those that denied him and, and wanted him to put to death, do you, and I, you think, do, are you skipping over Isaiah 52 and 53? Have you not read that that you're fulfilling exactly what that says? But yet he died for you and me. He could have called 10,000 angels. He bore our sins in his body. He was the, the sacrifice. He made him who knew no sin to become sin, a sin offering that is, on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Man, you and I are, clothed, are, are immersed in Christ, immersed in the water, and immersed by the blood. You and I put on Christ. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I love that concept of thinking. Christ took my sin off me and gave me a, a cloak of righteousness of which I put on. Pure, washed, white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All through the sinless sacrifice of the, of the cross. You know, he was bleeding before he went on the cross in that scourging. He bled. You know, he bled a lot. So that, notice this, having died to sin, we might live to what? Righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. For you were, continu were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer. Now those words are interchangeable. They're basically the same idea. He's a shepherd and overseer of our souls. Acts 20, Acts 20, 28, Paul said, Take care of yourself. Some of the elders. And so all the flock of which God has made you overseers. They were the overseers of the church. He is the shepherd, the overseer, the head of the church. Amen. He is the shepherd and overseer of the our souls. Again, we are a people for God's own possession. We were bought with a price. How great a price that was. What did it cost Christ? What did it cost man? Death of the Son of God. That's the price. And that's the only, and that's the only price that could pay. He paid a debt he didn't know. It wasn't his debt that he paid. He paid yours and mine. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, Amen. was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. It is well. Amen. It is well with my soul. I love that stanza. Amen. He didn't just take part of me, part of mine, but the whole of it. Washed them away. Pure and light. Much wider than snow. All because of Jesus' sacrifice. I think we're supposed to, I think we're supposed to get three or four more points in today, but this is still kind of... We're not on timeline because this is very vital information. Very vital because this is the gospel. Amen. The sinless Son of God died so that you could have eternal life. He didn't have to do that. No one since he did. He 
He kept saying, hey, God, could, God could want man dead. In Genesis 3. He could have man dead again in Genesis 6. Over and over again, there's opportunities in which God could say, no, I'm done with this. But he kept remembering the promises he made. God would not be God if he didn't keep his promise. That's why he didn't know to destroy you. That's why when you read history, why the women are still there. Because he remembered his promise. He remembered Jesus Christ. Read through the Old Testament and see the providence of God. Protect the sea line. All the way through the line of the tribe of Judah. If Judah had been wiped out completely, then God would have failed. But God, through that plan, from the beginning of the Bible says from before the foundation of the world, now how can you get that in your mind and comprehend that? I don't know. But God had that plan in mind. Since before the foundation of the world, that in Christ, you and I might have eternal life. He solved the problem of sin. And that is through Christ's sacrifice. And one day he's coming back. As we sing this song of invitation, this isn't just a song to sing. That sounds good like a good meal. These words should mean something as we learn the night of math. And I want us to examine ourselves and to, and to consider is what I'm singing right now absolutely 100% true. When we say all to Jesus, I surrender. May you never keep back a, a portion of anything that is not His. May we give our whole entire being to Him. I'll throw an illustration I think it's in one of C.S. Lewis's books about a set of keys that, of course this is not a little count, this is a good illustration. And knew that God gave a set of keys to a, to a steward. And in the day when God called him back and said, All right, I want my keys back. He gave, he gave the keys back to God. And God said, There's one missing. There's one missing. And so the servant said, Well, it's such a small key. I didn't think you would. I didn't think you would miss it. And God said, I don't want 90% of you. I don't want all of you. That's a good illustration. I don't want 90% of you. I want all of you. I purchased you. I didn't purchase half of you. I purchased you. When we go and purchase a house or a vehicle, we don't purchase half of it. We purchase the whole thing, don't we? We expect the whole thing. God purchased us with his own blood at 20. You might be subject to this invitation. We all are. You may need to respond publicly or privately. We all respond differently, but we will respond. How we respond is crucial. If you need encouragement publicly, just come now as we stand and as we sing. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Jesus I surrender.